a lot of renewables versus nuclear debate has been going on as of late. And others who are joining this debate are missing some much needed perspective. First, we have to realize that the scale of our current annual low carbon additions is nowhere near what is required if we want to avoid 2 degrees warming. The IPCC's RCP 2.6 scenario is out of range by orders of magnitude and that's because, in the aggregate, more fossil fuel generation capacity is being added than any other source. A mountain of carbon has to be scaled and we've barely managed to crest the first pebble. It is that bad. So, with all due respect, but the optimism that is abound when talking about renewables is hardly warranted at this moment. That doesn't mean that I don't want them to perform better. I do. Let me clarify that let me clarify that the argument shouldn't be about what will be built based on vague monetary figures. Cost can be interpreted and influenced in a thousand different ways. I can present the case for Hinkley C, for instance, being dirt cheap by merely spreading out the sticker price over a 60 year period and accounting for a 90% capacity factor over that 60 year lifespan. I can easily argue that the most expensive source of energy has the highest economic benefit, but that is not the point of this video. We can all say that technology X, for instance, is going to be so cheap. We won't build anything else anymore, but that's never going to happen. The energy business is not a monolith, and it is not chasing after the cheapest source of energy all the time. Granted, most energy companies are built on the principles of short to mid-term economic gain, but they also build robust energy portfolios. They diversify and try to secure long-term stability. Also, governments involved in energy production either tend to pick one set of technologies, like France did in the 60s for instance. But when we consider modern attempts at decarbonization, we mostly see diverse technologies. Countries are building all sorts of technologies and converting others, consider for instance coal to biomass conversions, wind and solar projects, but also nuclear. How much I dislike certain aspects of certain energy sources, I do acknowledge that they have a role to play in the future. And I know that you can cite a hundred reasons not to do technology X, but enunciating those ad nauseum doesn't help. We have to start thinking differently. I'm going to summarize a couple of leading technologies and I'm going to give you the pros and cons. So let's start. Solar PV has a very high material footprint, which tells us that we must deploy it diligently, rather than we have done up until now as we put large-scale PV plants up like Topaz and others. The strength of PV is that it is a daytime energy source, which can be coupled with daytime activities. A locally sourced energy used locally not exported into the grid could help bridge the gap to a carbon-free future. We must ensure a 100% cradle-to-cradle cycle for this technology and avoid at all costs that panels end up in landfills. Recycling a PV panel is not easy. It is a plastic vinyl sandwich of glass, PV elements, copper and aluminium. Even better is solar heating. I'm not talking about concentrated solar power here. Solar heating is basically a form of roof plumbing where solar heat is captured and put into the water heating system of a building. The great benefit here is that it immediately offsets the use of gas or other carbon-based fuels. It can be combined with heat pumps to provide more heat and cooling to a house. Capturing is much latent energy in a building without having to invest too much energy in it is what we need to do. Concentrated solar power, however, is a very limited source of energy thanks to its extremely high materials footprint and very specific deployment parameters. I don't have much positive to say about this technology. It's one of the less developed forms of renewable energy and it shows in the very small volume of capacity installed. It's a couple of gigawatts worldwide. 
we have to get into the terawatt scale to decarbonize a significant portion of today's energy landscape. We can differentiate between offshore and onshore wind. I have a strong preference for offshore wind because it affects the wildlife less and because it has a much higher capacity factor. Wind is relatively cheap, but it also costs a lot of materials and must be installed in places where it does the least harm to nature. Hydro energy is pretty much maxed out. It has a good materials invested to energy production ratio. Reliability is an issue in an age where climate change starts to mess up things hydrologically. We are probably not going to build a lot of large scale hydro in the future. Then there is biomass, which is a mixed bag. If we would burn vegetation that would otherwise rot, I'd be down with that but we are clear-cutting forests in order to feed big machines like the Drax power plant, which used to be a coal-fired power plant. It is debatable whether this is a carbon-neutral source. I maintain that a loss of biodiversity and the multi-decadal maturing process of trees are arguments to use against the so-called low-carbon nature of biomass. We also have tidal and wave energy, which are basically cousins of wind energy. They have a very high material footprint and low energy yield. So there's not much to see here. I don't think that these are going to play a big role. And some of the 100% renewable studies even agree with me. Finally, we get down to nuclear. We won't address this as if it is a monolith. First, we have contemporary nuclear power plants like the EPR, AP1000, EPR1400, Yulong-1, VVER, and such like. The negative thing about these is that they have high first mover costs. However, if we contrast these high first mover costs to energy generation over the lifespan of the plant, it turns out to be pretty cheap. Still, the high first mover costs are prohibitive. Also, you need experienced builders in order to finish a nuclear power plant on time. They can be built in as little as four years, but in some cases it took a decade or more to get them built. On average, a nuclear power plant takes about six to eight years to get built. That's much slower than a natural gas plant, for instance, which comes almost entirely assembled and can be built in less than a year. Nuclear power plants have the highest energy per unit of materials invested. So in terms of mitigating mining costs, nuclear power plants come in at the highest spot. Another clear benefit is that each one nuclear power plant immediately offsets multiple gas-fired power plants or one or two coal-fired power plants. They come with an extremely high power density. And the added benefit here is that in China, they are planning to remove the coal furnaces and replace them with pebble bed reactors so that they cost a lot less than a modern nuclear power plant and you maintain the valuable capital of a coal-fired power plant. Secondly, we have new nuclear or generation 4, whatever you like to call it. Forerunners here are terrestrial energy, Thorcon power and Terra power when molten salt reactors are concerned. And new scale wind pressurized water reactors are your thing. I want to focus on the molten salt reactor. The only real con I can find with these machines is cultural. Perhaps the fact that a core module doesn't last more than a decade may be seen as a con, but there are plenty of ways to deal with this issue. I am convinced that we will be able to recycle or re reuse them in due time. The pros, on the other hand, are manifold. High temperature operation, which allows for usage in steel and aluminium making, fertilizer production and fuel synthesis. These reactors can also be used in conjunction with the multi-stage flash desalination process thus being able to bring fresh water to millions of people in places like Cape Town, Los Angeles and plenty of other places. And finally, these reactors can be deployed by the hundreds per year, thus ensuring a learning curve similar to solar and wind. 
I left out grid integration in all energy sources because I am convinced that we will have to enhance power grids everywhere. A good functioning, robust power grid is the sign of a modern and prosperous country. These grids must be able to incorporate nuclear, hydro, geothermal, wind and solar and be stable. For now, nuclear and renewables in the aggregate at just enough to keep up with the annual fossil fuel additions. A lot must happen to change this. We must build more of all technologies involved. We have to double or triple the output of solar and wind, regardless whether you like it or not. We also have to double or triple the output of contemporary nuclear reactors, but we must certainly expedite the research and development of the fourth generation reactors, of which I named only four companies, but there are many more. Most people tend to forget that there are asymptotes everywhere. Consider for instance the fact that the asymptote for learning in wind and solar is slowly showing its face. Prices have now dropped so far that they are mainly driven by material costs. The same cannot be said for nuclear, where the EPR and AP1000 projects have been mired in cost overruns and delays, something which must be avoided in the future if we want to be able to climb Mount Carbon and keep our temperatures and the climate in a stable zone. The logic plays out like this. Coal, gas and oil are magnitudes bigger than renewable and nuclear. If we maintain this status, RCP 8.5 will probably become a reality and the world will become hotter and the climate will become very unstable. If we can put coal, gas and oil into a steady decline, we might be able to reach RCP 2.6, but that's only possible with negative emissions. Renewables alone in this economic and political climate will not achieve these conditions. Nuclear alone in this economic and political climate will not achieve these conditions. Only if we manage to strike a careful balance between nuclear and renewable deployments can we reach the lower end of the RCP 2.6 emission scenario, and that's also considering negative emissions. This means deploying large-scale nuclear power plants to directly offset coal and gas, deploying nuclear power stations for certain thermal processes, which is a large portion of today's energy mix, and a realm where it can outperform renewables, even in terms of cost, coming down as low as 2 cents per kilowatt hour, and we also have to add enough solar thermal and heat pumps to eliminate the usage of gas in homes and businesses for their heating purposes. Subsequently, we must add enough wind, solar, geothermal and a little hydro to help close the emissions gap. The most important consideration here being that we remain provident when the volume of mining is concerned. In the end, overhauling our energy system and creating a modern energy system in the developing countries will prove to be a world-scale Apollo project. Defeating climate change will come at a cost, that's for sure. It will require a monumental effort from our part, where we learn to couple the best possible energy sources together in a world-spanning effort and deploy them each to their strengths. Thank you all for watching and have a nice day.